Buckle up for the Money Vehicle Movement Podcast. I'm Jedediah Collins, your host and driving instructor on this journey through speaking the language of money. Twists, turns, and avoiding those money potholes will cover it all on our road trip to financial freedom. Engines ready? Then let's drive. Money is. How would you finish that sentence? Money is what? Welcome into the Money Vehicle Movement Podcast, where we're going to discuss what's happening in the market today, what you're covering in the curriculum, and a couple discussions from some pretty neat guests along the way. So let's dive in. What's happening? We're going to talk cybersecurity, thrifting, Mark Cuban, and McDonald's. What you're covering in your curriculum is going to be your money values and the gold standard. And Our story today is going to come from our very own Jedediah Collins. So the quote of the week comes from John Wooden. What you learn after you know it all is what counts. Think about that. The master, the man, the coach, the legend, what you learn after you know it all is what really counts. Okay, let's dive into the current events this week where we saw a cyber attack from Comcast, the the cable company, saying that 36 million accounts were hacked throughout the United States. Due to a network access through a third party Citrix, this is just a reminder that we all need to update our passwords on a regular basis because those 36 million people's information was just leaked and is now out. And if their passwords were in there, those are now up for grabs. So the questions to discuss in class, are you using cable still or are you streaming? What platform? When was the last time you changed your password? Think about that. You log into things all day, every day. When was the last time you changed that password? Are they all the same password? We're going to talk about that in chapter eight when we get into our cybersecurity. What else was happening? Well, we get to see this idea of your money values change before our eyes. Thrifting or worn wear, which is a new term for me, but I, we all grew up on thrift stores. Worn wear is a cooler term. This worn wear is becoming a staple for the new generation of shoppers, of you as consumers. Almost 20%, one fifth of gifts this holiday season were resold items. Think about that. All the presents, all the shopping, all the things, one in five items were actually being sold for a second time. This gives a vintage look for less. Think, I want to look good. I want to have style. I want it to be me, but I can't afford the the main brand pricing. This is where I pivot to, and you get your vintage, cool, unique look all for less. But why it's really winning a younger audience over Gen Z students is because it is becoming more eco-friendly. If I don't have to reproduce that jacket, well, how much less do I take out of our world and environment? That win, 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 cheaper, cooler, and more eco-friendly is why you've seen now 125 brands begin their own resale programs. 125 brands only four or five years after there was only two or three. An amazing rise in this new market. So questions to discuss in your class. What is a thrifting company or warnware company you have used? Do you see students your age changing their view on eco-friendly actions? Looking at shopping, looking at decisions, looking at investing. Is eco-friendly going to become a focal point of your generation? As we look at that, we are going to connect that to our money values in our income chapter. Moving on to the investment world chapter six, we see Mark Cuban, who has been a highlight on Shark Tank, the runaway success that Shark Tank is. He's been an investor in small businesses on there for over a decade and has just recently announced his retirement. In the same week of announcing his retirement from Shark Shark Tank, he is also selling the majority share ownership of his Dallas Mavericks. So he bought that company, that team, the Dallas Mavericks back in the year 2000 for $285 million and has turned that investment into $3.5 billion. Pretty good for about 20 years of 
owning a sports franchise. But we're going to talk about how you go from 285 million to three and a half billion in our economy and money supply as we jump into our curriculum later today. Questions to discuss for your cl classroom. How can you look up how much Mark Cuban sold his first company for back in the 1990s? He's getting that B billionaire status. He's had it for a long, long time. What is the most expensive sports franchise in the United States? Go ahead, look that up. But then next, look up what the most expensive sports franchise is in the world. Are they the same? Different sports, same sports? You tell me. All right, moving on into our key focus conversation today. Cash management is our subject of chapter three, and we're going to discuss our cash management through the eyes of the ever-changing fast food world. McDonald's is announcing this week that they are launching Cosmics, a new style, new brand that will be based on customizable drinks like a churro frappe. No idea, but yes, let's get one of those. You see Jack in the Box all of a sudden starting to have boba teas and Taco Bell now has iced coffees. All of this is due to a reason, and that reason is you. 62% of Gen Z students said they would they have tried a new beverage in the last year. And with this statistic, with this data, everybody loves talking about data. 62% of you said you've tried a new drink. So what do fast food chains say? We're going to shift our focuses to beverages. Competing with the almighty Starbucks, who has seen their foam and syrup drinks that are customizable to you, bring in a billion dollars in extra revenue. It is easy to form an obsession about these things. That is what the Gen Z student said. You look at the business of a billion dollar addition, a change in focus, a change in style, and you see the student, the consumer say it's easy to form an obsession. Why we connect this to our chapter three is because of the opportunity costs you have to make, but mostly that habit that you have to see. That Wall Street Journal article is really challenging how you as students think about your choices. Companies see what you're choosing and are now basing their businesses off of that data and information. They are built on marketing. They're making something you want become something you need. That is an obsession. Questions to discuss in your class. What was the new drink you tried last year? What was the name of it? Well, was it any good? Are customizable drinks worth $5 for you? And why do you think drinks like this become so addicting to students like you? Moving on from the current events of the week into your core curriculum and discussion in your classroom, we're going to circle back to that opening question. How do you finish that sentence? Money is what? Money is to you power, freedom. Money is overwhelming. Money is evil. Perhaps maybe it's just confusing. Money means something different to each of us. And depending on where we grew up, who we grew up around, or what we have used it for, our age, and why we are using it, it is amazing to see the different perspectives we can each have while looking at the same concept of money. But our own individual ideas of money are unique to each one of us. Too often, people confuse the value of money with a value based in time. For instance, we look at an hourly wage or an annual salary and see the connection of money to our time and are confused into thinking that money is connected to the amount of time we give it. We've all heard that old saying, time is money. And it leads us to believe that if we just put in more time, we will receive more money. This may be true in some cases. You get an extra shift or put in some overtime, you will hopefully earn more money but you are still not being paid for your time. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a, a project you need to get accomplished. Let's call it Project Garage Sale. You deem this project's gonna be worth $100. So somebody who can help you set up for your garage sale is worth $100 to you. Two employees come to you and say, I'd love to help you with Project Garage Sale. Employee A says, it will take me four hours to help you get garage sales set up and ready. Employee B says, I can get that done in one hour. Well, you look at that $100 project and you look at person A and you say, 
okay, I'll pay you $25 an hour for the four hours to get the job done. Or you look at person B and say, I'll pay you $100 for an hour to get the same job done. Same time, different pay. This is to show us that money is not based on our time, but is based on the value we add. Let me rephrase that, say that again. Money is not based on your time, but is based on the value you can add. This is why a professional athlete can make a million dollars in a single game, because the people of that company see their value to the business as deserving a million dollars. If you have an annual salary of $50,000, that's not one year of time, but that's the value that your boss thinks you will bring to the company in a year's period. If you disagree with your value, say it's more than $50,000, then you get to discuss and even begin to negotiate that with your employer. And I would suggest you come with a strategy, a plan, and a reason for why you think you're more valuable. So how do people add so much more value in less time today? Think about that story on Mark Cuban, 285 million to billions of dollars. Athletes today making hundreds of millions. Even the, the uh, hourly wage has increased. How can we continue to increase in money if we don't have a change? This leads us to our discussion around the money supply. When your parents were kids, they did not see many million dollar houses and a trillion dollars was more of a Star Trek number. What has changed over the past 30 years is that there has been an increase of dollars circling around the world. The money supply is just that. The total amount of United States dollars in the world's economy today. In 2000, the United States money supply was four trillion. In 2023, 23 years later, it is now 21 trillion. Year 2000, four trillion. 2023, 21 trillion. This massive increase in dollars could only occur when we, as the United States, under President Richard Nixon, decided to move our economy from a system based on a tangible resource to a system that was based on an intangible resource. Tangible being something you can touch, in this instance, gold. An intangible re resource being something you cannot touch, in this instance, confidence. We are looking at the change back 50, 60 years ago from a tangible resource where every dollar was connected to something, a touchable resource, to today where it is based on an intangible, untouchable resource. As we moved away from the gold system, back when the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was literally taking any dollar bill and exchanging it for, 30, for an ounce of gold, $35 equaled an ounce of gold, and any $35 in the world could walk in and get that exchange from the United States government for gold they had on hand. That was where we shifted. The dollar would now only be backed by the confidence in America's economy. That confidence was four trillion back in the year 2000, and today is $21 trillion and growing, a number that didn't even exist when I was your age. These questions and conversation points for your class this week can be discussed around crypto uh, cryptocurrency, because cryptocurrency is an intangible resource that is, excuse me, because the cryptocurrency economy is based on an intangible resource as well, that same idea of confidence. But the question comes for you, do you think crypto world can hold the same amount of confidence as the United States? How do you think cryptocurrency does hold value? And here's my biggest question. What percentage of your currency will be held in cryptocurrency in 30 years? That's a question I'd love to hear from your classroom. Okay, so back to the move from the gold standard and how it is connecting to your salary today. Well, it's because your value is not limited by time or gold as we once saw it being. Your value is abundant to the amount of value you can bring to that company. Your value is as abundant as the value you can bring. And that value is in a money supply and an economy that is not limited 
by a tangible resource, not limited by time, but only limited by the confidence of the United States and the confidence of our currency. Think you can dream bigger? When you start to think about what money is, do you think about it a little differently today, now that you see it, not tied to gold, not tied to time, but tied to an intangible thing like value, like confidence? Money, at the end of the day, is a reflection of what you value. It is a mirror showing you what you prioritize. Do you prioritize security, freedom, status, power? Money is a mirror for what you value. Money is, what's your response? Our guest today is former NFL player, fullback, certified financial planner, and founder here at Money Vehicle, Jedediah Collins. Jed, welcome in. We wanted to know if you could bring us a story, a thought, something from your old days, back when you were playing football that would be relevant or interesting to, to our students today. Oh, well, thank you for having me in. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. My story today is around this idea of hot 20s. I love this because it was one of the funniest moments I had in my NFL journey, and it taught me a pretty good lesson as well. So the NFL is an amazing opportunity. It's a great job. One of the reasons, many reasons, it was such a cool job is when we would go to away games, we'd go play opponents at their stadium. We'd have to fly and travel and be there the night before. And because we were there for our job, the company, the business had to provide food for us. And so sometimes the night before we wouldn't have an organized meal, they would give you cash money. Here is $60 for a dinner. Here is $120 for a dinner and breakfast. And they would just hand you an envelope and give you dollars. And it was the coolest little mini payday. I remember vividly my first time in Philadelphia playing for the Eagles when I went to a training uh, a preseason game and we went on the bus and they just started handing out these envelopes and there was like $140 in it. I was like, I'm rich. This is amazing. And we haven't even played the game. So as I look back at it, I remember getting on the planes and going and they would be handing us these, these uh, uh, per diems, these little envelopes full of cash. And one, every time you get on the plane, one of our veterans would sit as you walked by to board the plane, say hot 20s, and he'd hold out a bag. And you'd take $20 from your per diem, you'd write your number on it. I was number 45, so I wrote 45 on the $20 bill, and I'd drop it into the bag. And as everybody got in, sat down, you'd look at that bag. And there were some guys who put $20, $40, $60 in there. Most guys, a lot of guys didn't put any. But there would be six... $500, $600 in this bag. You all look at each other and go, hot 20s, hot 20s. And then the stewardess would come up, would reach her hand, his or her hand in the bag, pull out a $20 bill and read the player's number. Number 45, Jed won. That never happened. In this instance, we got a rookie. Oh, hey, number 28, rookie, you won. He gets all excited, jumps up, high five and everybody walks up. And that same veteran that was collecting all the $20 bills at the start looks at him. He was also a giant defensive lineman that nobody disagreed with. Looked at the young buck running back rookie and said, sorry, I forgot to tell you. Rookies can't win hot 20s. Go sit back down. Dejected, disappointed, and just deflated. Watching the rookie go sit back down after he thought. And then the stewardess pulled out another 20 and somebody else won. It was a funny, funny moment, but it was a lesson. Anytime you play a game, make sure you know the rules and make sure you know you can win. That's a little memory from mine. Next week, we're going to have new guests, new people, all in the hopes of teaching you and making this a relevant conversation in your classroom. We'll hear from you next week. Thank you for investing in your greatest asset. If you want to keep learning how to drive your money vehicle, make sure to subscribe to the Money Vehicle Movement podcast. Until our next pit stop together, stop working for money and start making money work for you.